Today we are over in a spot called Pelican Harbor Marina, which is over in North Bay Village. We only came here one other time before, which was several months ago. I think it was winter time. Figured I'd bring you guys back over here because a lot of people seem to like this spot. Now today I have a mishmash of a bunch of different things I want to talk about because I just found all these random interesting stories that sort of relate and sort of don't. The first one is this warning that I saw from Bank of America about check fraud and they're literally telling people to write less checks in order to keep your account information more secure and I'm gonna put this notice up on the screen so you guys can see what this is and what they're talking about and basically they're saying that paper checks contain personal information that anyone who gets their hands on can see and check fraud occurs when a criminal obtains money illegally using stolen checks or check information and scammers often target the mail to steal checks and other personal or financial information with the intent to commit fraud and identity theft. They might even alter the name payable on the check and the dollar amount. And Bank of America is saying, well, the only way to make sure that this doesn't happen to you is to just write less checks. So now they don't want you writing checks even though they're a bank. <laughs> and people have been writing checks for how many years? And the reason I thought this was interesting is because there's this whole push and talk about the potential of a coming CBDC, central bank digital currency, and a lot of people might look at this as, oh, this is just gonna be another way that this is gonna happen. They're gonna enforce CBDC through this. First, they don't want you to write checks, then they don't want you to have paper cash, and next thing you know, you just have money in a digital account online. Now they're telling people to use digital payment apps like Zelle instead of writing people a check. But if you've ever used Zelle before, there's a couple of problems with this, guys. First of all, that can be faked and people can get scammed out of sending the money to the wrong person with Zelle just as well, right? That happens all the time to the point now where these banks are saying they're not even gonna cover losses if you do something like this. It's on, the responsibility is on you to make sure you're transferring the money to the right person. So there's that aspect of it. But the other problem is, in case you've ever wanted to try to transfer somebody a large amount using Zelle, good luck with that, guys. Like most of the time, you're limited to sending like $2,000 and that's it. So you wanna write somebody a check for five grand? Can't do it because Zelle won't let you transfer that much money most of the time. So there's limitations with these online transfer apps when it comes to sending people money. Now some of the other stuff that they tell people to do here is actually smart when it comes to turning on your transaction alerts with your bank to make sure that you know every time some kind of transaction is going on, especially if it's above an amount that you would actually normally authorize. So that's a smart thing to do. And the other thing they're telling people to do is to shred any paper checks you have laying around that maybe you cashed already, as well as set up direct deposit with your bank. They're saying when you do send a check through the mail to use certified mail that has some kind of confirmed receipt attached to it. Otherwise, you don't know if the check gets lost in the mail. And I think that's a smart idea too, but the thing is, then you're paying you know six, eight dollars to send a check in the mail. And I actually had this happen to me before. I actually sent my mom a check in the mail many years ago and it was for a few hundred dollars. I don't even remember what it was for, but I sent her the check in the mail and I checked with her like a week later. Did you get it yet? No, nope, didn't get it. Two weeks later, nope, still didn't get it yet. Like, okay, what is going on? Why hasn't this check arrived? And I look at my bank and lo and behold, guess what? The check was cashed and it wasn't my mom. How is that possible? How did somebody else cash the check? Just like we talked about earlier here, that a lot of times these checks can be modified for a different amount or a different name. This check wasn't even modified, guys. So you don't even need the check to be modified for check fraud to happen to you because whoever stole my check was able to cash it in their bank pretending to be my mom, you know, just signing the check. So whoever the teller was at this bank hopefully was fired because they made a huge mistake by allowing this fraudster to cash a check that didn't even belong to them. You're supposed to ask for ID and, you know, prove that the name on the check matches the person who has the account 
and they have an, an ID to prove that it's them. But obviously this teller didn't do that and it allows check fraud like this to run rampant. And so this has been going on for a very long time. This is not a new thing. I've had commission checks stolen from my office, okay? Sometimes we get commission checks uh, sent to our office. Well, not anymore, guys. I always try to tell anybody who's sending a commission check to our office from now on to send an ACH instead. Send it straight to our escrow account and forget about sending the check in the mail because I've already seen checks stolen numerous times. People say they sent the check, it never arrives, and then the person who sends the check has to go through the, the hassle of canceling the check, which sometimes can even cost money with your bank, then have to go through the same effort again to send the same payment, only this time through an ACH. I hate getting checks in the mail when it comes to that because you just don't know when it's gonna be stolen or lost or whatever, and it's just not worth the hassle, to be honest. So I do think ACH transfers are a good alternative, you know, over writing checks and sending checks in the mail. And as far as I know, there's no dollar amount limit on that, which is one of the problems with sending money with Zelle or Venmo or Cash App or one of those other payment platforms. They have limits on how much you can send. But if you do a direct ACH from one account to another, they shouldn't be limiting you unless you have an actual limit on your account or with your bank. Now we're always talking about how crazy the insurance situation is down here in Florida. And when I saw this, I couldn't believe it. I saw a YouTube video over by St. Pete, Florida with this guy who has a condo on the 10th floor over there and he has Citizens Insurance. And Citizens is insurance company of last resort, guys. You, you only get a policy with Citizens if no other insurance company will take you or the other options are far more expensive than Citizens and that's the only way you can qualify for this. This guy, since he's on the 10th floor and he has Citizens, required him to get a flood insurance policy because I've covered this as well talking about all the changes that Citizens has made and beginning April 1st of this year, if you have a Citizens homeowner's insurance policy, then you're now required to have flood insurance as well. Look at this, guys. I gotta show you this real quick. Look how many fish there are. Super cool. Now. This makes sense for houses, unless you're not even in a floodplain, but it doesn't matter if you live in a house, you have citizens, and it doesn't matter if you're in a floodplain or not, you have to get the flood insurance policy, okay? But for condos, this absolutely makes no sense at all, especially if you're on the 10th floor. And that's exactly why this guy is completely outraged, and he's trying to see if he can get the policy canceled. But it turns out the only way you can cancel the flood insurance policy is if you request a refund during the 30-day waiting period when you actually signed up for it. So if it was after that, if you signed up for the policy and you've already had it for a few months, tough. You gotta wait. You're pretty much out of luck. You're stuck having this uh, flood insurance policy on a condo for the next year. So that would really suck. That's a huge waste of money. But apparently the Florida legislator is supposed to be putting forward um, a revision to this by the end of this month to exempt high rise condos from this citizen's insurance requirement, which makes a lot of sense guys, because nobody in a high rise condo is gonna be having a flood insurance claim, at least for their individual unit, which is what this is for. You know, it's one thing if the basement or the garage gets flooded and there's a claim, but that goes towards the building's master insurance policy, it has nothing to do with you as the individual owner on the 10th floor. And this kind of leads me right into the next thing that I saw from Fairway Mortgage. We were putting up a bunch of the uh, crazy things that these guys were saying to get people to buy a home. But this week, they actually had some solid advice, and I wanna give them credit for that for all the times I pick on them, because listen to what they say, guys. Tip of the week. Did you know that hazard and flood insurance premiums can make or break your loan approval? If the debt to income ratios go high once insurance is chosen for a specific property, that can convert an approval into a denial. With this in mind, 
Here are a few suggestions. You are not approved to a purchase price slash loan amount. You are approved to a maximum payment. Ask your loan originator to run the numbers for a specific property prior to making an offer. Also smart. And you want to make sure they're using realistic estimates for insurance when qualifying your borrower for a specific home so the deal doesn't fall apart right before closing. Also excellent advice. Your loan originator should be checking to see if it's in a flood zone so they can more accurately predict the full monthly payment. If your originator doesn't check for the flood zone for each property you're making an offer on, ask them to or at least do it for them so you aren't left with a canceled contract three weeks into the deal. So once again, this is solid advice because this insurance problem has become such a nightmare here in Florida. Like when you go onto Zillow, for example, and you're looking at any home down here in Florida and they give you the monthly estimate of how much it's gonna to cost to buy that house, one number that's in there that's almost a guarantee is not even close to accurate anymore is how much your yearly insurance premium is gonna be on the house because things have been flipped so upside down here. Because like it said right in there that you are approved for a specific payment if you're looking at a house that right now is $3,000 a month according to Zillow, well, once you get the real insurance numbers for this, it might be $4,000 a month, guys. It might be $3,500. It could be significantly higher than what you're approved to spend. And like it said, your approval can go from an approval to a denial just like that. But make no mistake, this advice does not apply just to Florida. If you're looking to buy real estate here, this is advice you need to take no matter where you live guys like insurance is getting flipped upside down everywhere in fact in my insurance video i did earlier this week a bunch of you were writing me telling me from other states that your premiums tripled and you don't live in florida you live in places like colorado or um, wisconsin you know where insurance is going up even though you don't live in a crazy natural disaster area like this so this can happen to anybody. Beware of this when you're out shopping for a home, okay? And by the way, if you are shopping for a home right now, guys, or you wanna sell one, I have the option for you to get a real estate agent free of charge if you need a professional in your area. I work with people from all over the entire United States. Feel free to use my link in the description below. Not only does it help you, but it helps the channel as well. Oop, looks like inflation's hitting everywhere, including the marina. Nowhere is safe. Now here's something else interesting I saw about Florida today is that they're noticing that home prices near the newly developed Brightline stations across the state are the homes that are going up the most in value and the fastest. And they found out that in Fort Lauderdale, for example, home values for residences that are within the zip code near the Brightline station have appreciated by 67% since 2018 compared to a 33% median price appreciation across Broward County. So almost double what the average home has appreciated for in Fort Lauderdale. And in Miami, the values near the station went up 83%, whereas the typical here in Miami went up 38%, guys. So in both cases, home values practically went up twice as much and twice as fast as it did in all other areas. And the same is true for rent as well. Rent premiums in Fort Lauderdale went up by 28% in these areas that are close to the station. And you know, what's funny about this to me is people are commanding a higher price for these properties just because they're close to the station, right? Well, what is the whole point of moving close to the station? The only reason to move close to the station, as far as I'm concerned, is to save money on your commute, right? To be able to actually uh, not have to pay as much in your commute costs every single year from driving back and forth to work and saving money on the time, right? That's pretty much the only reason to do this as far as I'm concerned. That kind of negates the cost that you're going to be saving, I would say, if you have to pay twice as much money for, you know, a house or a rental in the area versus somewhere a little bit further away. So does it make any sense to you to move close to a bright line station and pay far more for the property just because it's close by versus somewhere else? Good for these property owners that have been able to capitalize on this, no doubt, but I just think it's insane 
that anybody would think about actually paying extra for one of these properties just to be close to the station because you're kind of defeating the whole point of moving close to a station. That's what I think. Let me know what you guys think about that. <laughs> now here's the next thing and I told you this was going to be random today guys. <laughs> when is it a good idea to borrow money using a personal loan to pay for wedding expenses? Um, let me think. How about never? Right now the average wedding in the United States costs about 30 grand, which is already ridiculous when you think about it. This was a story that I saw that, you know, people are writing in and asking for help with like, oh, what should I do? Should I borrow money in order to pay for the wedding? And basically the advice is, well, you should be saving up as much as you can, but if you need to borrow the difference, go ahead. It's not a big deal. I mean, this is crazy, guys. I mean, we know that the world and everything right now runs on debt and that's part of the big problem that we have with today's society but encouraging people to go into debt in order to get married is absolute insanity and you know what else they say in here also be careful because if you're going to apply for a personal loan to get married if you default on that loan or you have trouble with it then it can hurt your ability to buy a house which is usually the next thing that people want to do after they do get married oh i didn't think about that right but not only that guys but the other thing that they didn't even mention here that i thought about whenever i read this is when you take out any sort of a loan this is going to increase your debt to income ratio so say you're taking out a personal loan to go and get married now you want to go buy a house now you're going to qualify for less house because you took out that personal loan because now you have more debt obligations that increase your debt to income ratio therefore lowering how much you can get approved on a house for kind of stupid right and i'm definitely not saying that anyone should go out and buy a house right now guys but the reality is things are not how it used to be 30 or 40 years ago okay back in the day people could get married and then go buy a house sometimes even on one income and we know that those days are definitely over at least for most of us in my opinion i think it's much smarter these days like if you're with somebody seriously and you're planning on getting married get the house first guys live together for a little while see what that's like and own some real estate go through the financial trouble of that first to see if your marriage can even uh, withstand that first of all but the other reason to do that in my opinion is because housing has become so expensive that I think it's much better to get the house first and worried about getting married later because anybody who owns a house can verify that it is extremely expensive to own a house and it's so expensive now that you know owning a house will make getting married look cheap I think this is just an absolute disaster that they're encouraging people to get into debt to get married if they don't have the full amount how about not get married how about keep saving for the house guys because you're gonna need that right especially if you're still living with mom and dad or renting a place and have dreams of buying a house so I think it's completely stupid to do this that's my opinion the other big reason I think this is totally stupid is because the number one reason that people get divorced and couples fight is because of why money okay money so yeah let's start off our marriage with you know a huge bucket of debt in order to just get married and then we're going to fight with each other and complain whenever we can't afford to buy a house after this so that's not good you don't want that you know what i'm saying i think this is just going to cause more problems in people's marriages than they need and um, they're just setting themselves up for disaster so let me know what you think about this do you think it's smarter to get married first and then buy the house or buy the house and then get married because we're living in a backwards world guys so in my opinion it's time to start doing everything backwards you know gone are the days of you know getting married first and getting the house later home prices are absurdly expensive you need to have a huge down payment you need to have a huge nest egg saved for repairs and potential problems with the house and that's before you ever even think about getting married that's what i think but let me know what you guys think about that if you enjoyed this video make sure you click the bell notification down below youtube will alert you every time i post a new video and if you don't want to wait check out my next one on the screen right over here and i'll see you in the next one